well, at least I tried once and I got chucked off the golf course because uh, I was told that I wasn't good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm not going to try and claim any prowess, but um, now I will, uh, you know, tell everyone a secret that I have once played golf and right near the clubhouse, I did this amazing hole in one. It was a complete fluke, but because wow. it was in front of the clubhouse, everyone saw it. And so from then on, they thought I was some amazing player when I really am completely hopeless. So, but this is completely unrelated. Um, so, if I get to business, <laughs> so um, is that not with, are we not talking about golf then? Well, I, I was looking at the topic, and I was ABRSM has a new golf syllabus. Maybe no. <laughs> um, well, look, everyone, welcome um, to join us today. And as you can see, Dr. Samantha looks slightly different. Unfortunately, <laughs> she was she, <laughs> she she was unable to join us today. And um, so the ABRSM went out to the whatever the main road is in London and um, found <laughs> this gentleman. And luckily for us, this gentleman is, is, is Mr. Williams. And he happens to be the head of music at Radley College. He happens to be sitting in 32 degrees Celsius while um, some of us, namely those where I live, are sitting in eight degrees Celsius. So we're opposite sides of the world, opposite sides of the day and opposite temperatures. But um, it's such a blessing that to have you here, Mr. Williams. And just for everyone to know, he has told me that he drinks three types of tea and one starts with L and I've forgotten. And that's Lapsang. his favorite, Lapsang. And then there's Earl Grey and he mentioned mint tea so um you can all feel horrified but he did clarify that maybe mint is not really tea so um for those who were about to walk out over <laughs> that that admission so um but ne nevertheless we've had way too much um silliness already right <laughs> so let's get to business um mr williams i want to welcome you i want to thank you for joining us for all of us and i can see people from asia the UK and Australia in the room and probably other that I don't recognize. So everyone feel free to put in the chat or if you're watching on the live stream, feel free uh, to put on on the Facebook live stream um, where you're joining us from. That would be lovely. If you've got any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And if there's time at the end, we'll we'll throw them at Mr. Williams. But without any further ado, thank you for coming, Mr. Williams. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much and, and welcome everyone and welcome to my teaching room at Radley College which is just south of Oxfordshire, uh, sorry just south of Oxford in Oxfordshire and um, yeah it is 32, in fact it's now 33 degrees outside and getting warmer as those of you who are in those of you who, uh, who are in the United Kingdom will certainly know it's going to be an absolute scorcher today and I think we're aiming to arrive about 40 degrees so um, I'm essentially going to talk you through uh, some of the highlights of the ABRSM New Piano Syllabus 2023-24. Uh, um, there are various different ways one could do this and I've decided just to select a few pieces which represent the sort of new, the exciting, uh, things which uh, are, are a little bit different um, but at the same time draw some threads through from some of the earlier grades to uh, show you how important musical playing is even in the early grades. So there's a sort of a uh, an element of, of teaching in there, of, of just sharing some teaching ideas and some teaching thoughts with you. I'll play little bits as well and hopefully introduce a few pieces that you might otherwise not know. Um, so I, I've called this talk Continuity, Diversity and Innovation. And of course, one of the most important things for uh, everybody is the idea of continuity in the sense that we need to know that we need to be familiar with what we are teaching our, our students to some extent. Um, and I'm just going to play you just one piece that is in the grade eight syllabus. I'm actually going to start at the top end mostly. Um, you all know this, um, I hope so. I hope my fingers know it as well. Just a little bit of it. Here we go. Well, I hope 
that most of you recognise most of the notes there. That was the Allegro from uh, Mozart's Sonata uh, in F. And it's full of opera, it's full of charm, it's full of, there's a bit of drama in there. Um, essentially, without understanding much about Mozart's music, and particularly about his obsession and passion with opera, it's very difficult to understand a piece of music like that. But the one thing that we do know about it is that it has been um, a staple part of ABRS and assessment uh, pieces. In other words, this is repertoire that everybody plays, great repertoire that anybody can enjoy outside an assessment, as it were, that just happens to have been chosen for an ABRS and assessment. So they are not grade pieces. We need to get that absolutely out of our head. This is not a grade piece. Mozart never intended it to be used for an assessment. And if he realised it was set for an ABRS and grade eight, he'd probably be horrified. But there we go. Um, we have the luxury, the pleasure of being able to play some of the greatest repertoire ever written and use it for an assessment, a signpost, which tells us that we've got to a particular level. Um, so understanding of opera, really important for this. Um, and the ability to be able to um, shape a musical phrase over the top at the same time as keeping a left hand accompaniment out of the way. We are a, a piano orchestra in every sense of the word. So the idea of these sort of lovely figurations being suitably quiet and harmonic in the background so that we can hear this beautiful tune and shape it. What, what other things are there about that phrase? Um, you can't see the score here, but if you looked at your Mozart score, you'll find that every bar is phrased with a phrase line. So it actually looks like that if you took it literally. But of course we know, because, uh, because we're musicians and we're pianists, that uh, Mozart never intended it to be played that way uh, because phrase markings don't mean the same in Mozart's time as they do now. Uh, now we take them literally, and that's how Prokofiev writes them. Uh, but in Mozart's time, they were just string bows. They were the equivalent of an up bow and a down bow. So, so we have a legato sense of line. Um, how, does our, how do our students know this? Well, again, this is something, this is part of their journey from, where, from the very beginnings of learning to play the piano. This understanding of context of what markings mean, of the, of the meaning of notation. But also, what's possible within that score? What are we trying to communicate? What is Mozart trying to communicate here? And above all, how do we do it technically? How do we control that? We can't suddenly come to a grade eight piece like this and expect to play it with charm and with that beautiful balance if we haven't already got some of that under our fingers and some of that control. Moments of articulation, for instance, like this, where we get, where each one of those three E's is, is marked exactly the same thing with a little sort of uh, um, uh, triangular uh, uh, staccato mark. But of course we know that's interchangeable with normal staccato marks with, with Mozart. But of course all it means is it's detached from the, say, from the next note. It doesn't tell you how long that note lasts. So every one of those has a different length to it to give it its shape as well as the dynamic. How do we encourage our pupils to understand that when they get before they get to grade 8 really? Um, is that something that they only discover when they get to grade eight and i'm going to just take you through and argue that it's not it's something that we discuss and we explore from the very very earliest stages so let's look at this um, idea of continuity um, so you'll find that um, se about 70 percent of the repertoire um, is familiar popular repertoire from a previous syllabus and other syllabuses uh, so that's a brilliant thing so we've got stuff that we music that we can enjoy and, and that pupils can enjoy because just because we have heard the Pathétique Sonata, for instance, 143 times with our uh, grade 8 and beyond pianists, doesn't mean for them it's not the very first time they've heard it and that they're really excited about it. They will be hugely excited. So just because some of this repertoire is um, uh, known and familiar to us, we've got to maintain and keep that excitement about it. So that's 70% of it. And um, what about other, other things that give us our continuity? Well, of course, supporting tests. Um, now, you all, all know that there is a... Um, a, a performance exam, which, we, which you can take a performance assessment, uh, which you can take, which doesn't involve scales and doesn't involve oral and doesn't involve sight reading. And, and for the right person, they are the right thing. But the one thing that we love, I think, maybe our students don't, but one thing we love as teachers, is this idea that, that the assessment is not just about can you play the piece, it's about do you have those musical foundation skills that you need to be able to teach yourself. We are trying very hard to uh, to turn our pupils into independent learners. And so these supporting tests all show us that these pu our pupils are on their way to being independent. 
you know, if they can sight read and they can sight read well and they can sight read musically, we know that they've already got a clear idea of how that piece sounds before they even bring it to the teacher. Um, if their oral skills are good, they've got the self-checking mechanisms to be able to think about what does that note actually sound like? What's the note uh, sound like on the score? Is, am I hearing the same note? So are they the same? How, you know, is, is it the same rhythm? Uh, is it the same pitch or is it the same dynamic? So if we've got those oral skills, they're going to help us learn the piece in between our lessons. And of course, uh, the duet option is still offered at lower grades. Wonderful addition to the ABRSM syllabus where uh, you, know, you do have the, the option of actually playing a piece with the support of something else in the background. And I don't know how many of you have the luxury of a second piano or a second keyboard in your teaching room, but there is no more joy and pleasure than being able to just put a few interesting chords and things underneath a very simple piece, uh, which just brings it to life that little bit more, and uh, as duets do. But of course, continuity is one thing. What about diversity? Um, well, in this particular syllabus, there are 47 composers who are completely new to an ABRSM syllabus. Um, exciting and imaginative choices by composers from increasingly diverse backgrounds and, um, and, and nationalities as well. So a large number of pieces by um, female composers and a large number of pieces also uh, by living composers. I'm just doing a, a, a double check here that um, there we go. Oh, we've got a sorry. There's UCAS points, by the way. <laughs> We're just going through this this list. UCAS points still available for grades six, seven, and eight. I'm just double checking that um, we're that I'm with you and that we've got the same sh screenshot in front of us. So we've got that diversity. So we talked about uh, the composers who are completely new and exciting and imaginative choices. So yeah, composers from diverse backgrounds and nationalities large numbers of pieces by female composers, and I'll certainly touch on quite a few of those as we go through, um, and large numbers of composers as well by living composers. Just give me two seconds, I'm just gonna flip something on here, so that, um, which is for this, there we go. Um, and yes, and large numbers of, of pieces by living composers as well. And what about innovation too? So here, um, a greater choice of repertoire than before. So in other words, our lists are extended. So we've got 39 pieces in total per grade. Um, and the really important thing to remember, let's get all this sort of nitty gritty out of the way before we get onto real music, um, are that a pianist taking exams during 2023 can choose to play either three pieces from the 2021-22 repertoire lists or three pieces from the 2023 or 24 repertoire lists. So you can't mix and match, uh, but because anyway there is an overlap and because anyway you've got this repertoire extended it shouldn't really matter um, so in a sense we're, we're really listening very hard to what the teachers are asking for um, and giving lots of choice in the same way that some of the other syllabuses do too and of course inspiration for me one of the most important things of all uh, the fact that there is exciting and that, that, that all these lists have really exciting and very beautiful repertoire lists in, um, here uh, familiar and popular teaching pieces, new and imaginative commissions um, of discovered gems. Uh, lots of really very beautiful pieces in this. Um, Rachel, can I just um, come in and just check that you're hearing me okay? Yeah, I'm hearing you fine. I, I'm, my, the, my screen is a slide behind uh, m most of the time, so I'm just... I, I'm seeing the screen, I think, with what you're saying. Are you? So, I, I, right, it's just literally just, just gone on to the, the inspiration uh, slide. So I just want to check that everybody's on oh, the we can, we, on the we, we can see the inspiration slide now. Lovely, perfect. Okay. Um, so this just gives you a little bullet point as, as to the sorts of things that you can expect from the piano syllabus list. And if we look at the next slide, uh, you can see that there's a, a roughly how th this might work on a typical grade. Uh, you've got a certain number of new pieces, but you've got quite a large number of retained pieces as well. And I think uh, for all of us teachers, and I'm very much a teacher myself, uh, this is a really welcome addition to the piano syllabus. Um, so the way I'm going to just talk you through some of these pieces, and uh, let's get onto the music straight away, uh, is to talk about something called the Road to Parnassus. Now, some of you may think, oh, I have no idea what Parnassus is. Uh, Parnassus is actually um, a, a mountain in Greece and um, 
And of course, Debussy wrote a very famous piece, which was Gradus ad Parnassum, based on a series of Clementi exercises. Uh, this is the piece. <laughs> I'm sure you'll all recognise that, and many of you will have taught that many times before. Um, so rather sad Parnassum based on this set of Clementi exercises that get harder and harder and harder. And of course he wrote that for his daughter who was practising these exercises, getting very despondent with them, and at the end we have the, the sort of musical slamming of the piano lid. Um, but in terms of uh, how we get to the top of our mountain, um, and the musical route to the top of our mountain, I'm going to make the top of our mountain grade 8, and then I'm going to show you how some of the repertoire that we can choose in the early grades um, can lead us towards uh, that, those grade 8 pieces. What it is they're demanding of us, really, and, um, and equally, um, what, how we need to think very musically about early grade pieces. And, and as I say, I'm going to use some of the um, sort of less um, well-known repertoire from this brand new and exciting new syllabus uh, to get you there. Uh, so first of all, let's have a look at one or two of the pieces that you will all know. Uh, so these are three pieces which are there, I'm not going to focus on these three, but they're three pieces which involve um, good articulation, good, really good control, um, uh, um, and the, where the character is a lot about the rhythm, it's a lot about, uh, uh, as I say, the, the, the subtlety of articulation, um, and, or, of course, uh, about quick finger control. So here's a little bit of a piece that you'll all recognise. It's the guy on the left there. Um, it's called J.S. Bach. I think some of us may know him. It's a wonderful piece. Um, we talked about continuity in the syllabus. Well, this was in, in 1971, it was in, in 1982, it was in, in 1993, and it was in, in 2011. So we've got, uh, obviously, one, a, a really great teaching piece that's been in lots of the, uh, included in lots of the grade, uh, grade pieces, together with the fugue. Um, so it's a wonderful fugue. This is the fugue subject. There's a, a, a wonderful guy, a musicologist called Ebenezer Prout, and in order to remember all of the tunes, the melodies, the subjects of the, uh, of the fugues, he put words to it. And his words for this, I have to read it off the score here because I can't remember, was a little three-part three fugue which a gentleman called Bach composed. There's a lot of triple counterpoint about it and it isn't very difficult to play. Um, which is wonderful. Gives you sort of an idea of the character and the articulation that you might use. You know, a little three-part fugue. And you notice, um, those of you who are sort of native English speakers out there, um, how each one of those words has a different sort of articulation to it. Some of it's shorter, some of it not quite so short. And that's what we do with music. We, we play with the articulation. So I started off with slightly longer uh, articulation and then got a bit shorter as we went through. That's normal, that's, that's how we shape things. Uh, um, but of course it's quite sophisticated. Do we need that for grade eight? eight? Yeah, absolutely, because we're playing this piece and it needs that sort of uh, uh, subtlety and range and imagination in the articulation. Um, so let's look at another piece which has, has um, been in before. Uh, it's a wonderful piece of um, Albanith um, and, and it relies for a lot of its excitement on, on an understanding of Spanish rhythms, the idea that you get this one, two, three, one, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, that those sorts of dance rhythms and song rhythms um, of, of Spanish music, um, and also the idea of guitar articulation. This is the piece, just a little bit of it. Uh, 
And so you get the idea, um, uh, lots of play, playing with the time there, that's something that doesn't just happen at this sort of great, uh, at this sort of level, there have to be pieces somewhere in the, that pupil's experience uh, to be able to play things like that. And this, uh, the idea of this real clarity of articulation there, uh, but also um, the idea of, of a lightness of articulation and variety too, and uh, just to get this sort of guitar-like effect. And, and a very similar sort of piece, this is the, uh, uh, this is the Debussy arabesque number two, which all, you'll all know. Uh, and this requires a real lightness of touch, of course, and again, this articulation, this clarity of articulation. Uh, this one much more rhythmic, you don't pull this one around so much, this is a different sort of piece, a different sort of genre and idiom. <laughs> And so, so that sort of real filigree, that, that sensitivity and touch in the ends of the fingers um, there to, to achieve that sort of sound and, and the sort of um, humour that you need to actually bring through. Again, it doesn't just start at grade 8. Where does that start? Um, and where does it start to... Um, uh, where, where do we sort of encourage this to develop and nurture this in our students? Um, there are two pieces in particular, however, which I just want to focus in on at grade 8, and then we'll see how this all builds up. Um, we're going to uh, focus on two very different sorts of uh, uh, pieces to the ones you've just heard here. And the first one um, is by a French pianist called uh, Louise Ferenc. So, so first of all, our female composers here. Uh, it, it's essentially a very beautiful song without words. <laughs> isn't it, in, in, in its romanticism and, and the beauty of its top line. Um, and it needs, of course, within one hand, the ability to be able to play a, a really quiet accompaniment with a tune at the top um, as well. So, so not just between the hands, but within one hand and also balancing out the left hand to get that beautiful shape and get that, get that sense of this piano orchestra, which you'll, you'll hear me talk a lot about. Um, and of course, if you were looking backwards um, at certain pieces, you'll find that there are some which uh, introduce these ideas in, in uh, using very simple notes and using some um, uh, far less sort of complex ideas. But of course, if you're looking forwards, where does this lead to? Well, of course, this leads to something like this. which as we know is a middle section which is which is beyond grade eight um, but uh, this is where this sort of this, this sort of piece leads to so that every piece is a stepping stone to a particular sort of other piece as it were um, so yeah what listening skills do we need as well and this is really important part of, of playing the piano so we get these middle notes And it's one thing controlling them, it's another thing hearing them, it's another thing understanding that there is the melody note. And this note here is not important at all, we have to bring that out of the way, because that F always has to be, say, the loudest note, so does the G flat. And even though these notes are being played with our heaviest finger, our thumb, they have to be some of the lightest notes. And going to tell us whether we've got that right, that balance in our ears. We have to really listen to it and be aware of, of listening through notes. Pianists are not good uh, at listening to the ends of notes and the middles of notes. They're very good at listening to the beginnings, but not so much as to what's happening to it after that. I tend to forget about them. Uh, there. And in the middle of this, uh, there's a, a, a complete change around, really. We have quite a demanding little passage where we've got a tune at the top of chords in the right hand. <laughs> Texture here, 
uh, as this is Balsam 34. <laughs> really quite demanding to have that tenor register projected there um, is, is hard at the best of times but in bar 37 I don't know whether we've got bar 37 on the, on the slide there yeah exactly where the, where the cursor is we've got the tune goes into the middle of a three note chord that's that's really quite challenging one chord uh, which which almost um, shows you how much control your your musician or little pupil needs your pupil needs to be able to play this because otherwise that tune doesn't go to the right place. Uh, so. um, and so we've got those ideas. Without that, the, it's going to sound very noty. We're going to have too much of our, our, our semiquavers. We're not going to hear where the tune is. And, and the balance and control and listening that needs to go on there is quite sophisticated. So, so that's one of our pieces. Uh, which I'm sort of going to lead to, the, the Lewis Perry. And the other one is a piece by um, Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Uh, again, another part of our sort of the diversity theme here. Uh, this is this impromptu in B minor, or impromptu, of course, impromptu, of course, being just a, 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 a composed piece, just, a, just something that you've just done on, on the spur of the moment. Uh, it, it doesn't really sound like that, though it does sound a little bit improvised, I suppose, one could say, in, in certain bits. Um, and in this piece, we're, we're talking about um, changes of mood and changes of character, which are quite hard to, uh, to manage sometimes. It's, a, it's quite a moody piece, so it might be quite good for some of the, teen some of the teenagers amongst your pupils. All these lovely sort of sighing, um, uh, uh, breathy sort of phrases in the opening here, um, which I'll just demonstrate to you. So you've got this. Uh, of um, free song of shivers in, 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 those, in those triplets um, and as I say that it's, it's got a bit of the sort of um, it's not just moody it's got a bit of the sort of stranger things I, I, I know um, some of you will know the Netflix series that's gone viral called Stranger Things and uh, which has featured Kate Bush uh, who's a, I'm a great fan of I have to say uh, in, in, as some of her music um, and there's a, there's a sense of mysteriousness about this and, and, and the unusual uh, going on here too to, um, tone quality and balance and interpretation of course, if you have a look at the very first bars here, we've got this accent on the final chord. But actually, to play something like this... It doesn't make any musical sense, of course. It's, it's what's written, but it doesn't make any musical sense. So we have to try and think about our interpretation and, and how we absorb that into a narrative. You know, what's going on? It's almost like it's, you're expecting something, but it's not there. So you, it, it's that unexpected. Um, that those that stranger things moment. So, because it's in, within a pianissimo context too. So we've got um, a, 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 a really interesting five, six, seven, eight bars of, uh, of, of to talk about our, with our pupils about interpretation. Um, and to be able to talk about interpretation at that sort of level, what does that accent mean? What, what, what does it sound like? What are we trying to convey to our audience? How are we going to convey it? Uh, right down to how do we balance those three note chords? Do we play these chords so they're equal? Or so the F sharp is more? Or so that the B is more? Or so that D is more? I'd suggest the D, but who knows? And be able to voice the same thing on the second chord as well. So that's a subject of interpretation. How loud is this note? How loud does that need to be when we get to the end of the bar? How much is that is that accent? You know, it's it's all to do with the sound that we want. There are no rights and wrongs about anything. I've just just asked the questions about, but it's something that really needs discussing. Um, and if you are going to have a, a lesson, a piano lesson, which it discusses interpretation at that sort of level, then it's so important uh, that 
learning the notes and being able to play the notes is not the biggest battle. It's not the biggest level of challenge for that pupil. And I'll, uh, again, I'll come back to this little thing, which is this level of challenge. Making sure that, um, as, as sort of appraising your lessons, and I do this myself, how much of my lesson did I spend doing practice with my people? It literally just sort of working at passages, showing them how to practice it, getting it right, sorting out the notes, sorting out the rhythms. If the bulk of your lesson, if, if more than say, 30% uh, of your lesson in, in, is involved doing that, then the notes are too hard, those pieces are too hard, and they shouldn't be tackling something quite that challenging in terms of notes. But I don't think, I don't believe you should ever not challenge your pupil absolutely to the full, or your young musician to the full, in terms of the interpretation of that piece. You're, you're always aspiring to play the piece that they've got in front of them to the level of a concert pianist, the, the highest possible musical reward, because that's what will keep them going. That's the thing that they will enjoy the most when you're talking at, that, uh, at, at a musical level with them. And the notes are part of the challenge, but they're no, by nowhere near the main, main challenge. And so that's what we're talking about here with this piece as well, making sure that the journey there is right and that they are ready to play a grade eight piece, not just because they want to take grade eight, not just because they want the UCAS points, not just because it follows from grade seven. Really important, there's a massive gulf of experience and knowledge and understanding and technical control and, and, and tonal colors between grade seven and grade eight. Um, it's, it, it, it's the way it goes. Um, within this piece too, of course, you've got lovely tenor lines to bring out and chords, voicing chords here in the, there's a lovely um, sort of gospel middle section to this. chromatic line uh, in, in the left hand there. Uh, it's, a, it's a fabulous piece, really wonderful. So they're, they're sort of our top of our Parnassus Hill, as it were. Um, so let's have a look at how we get there and the sorts of pieces that might give us uh, um, a, 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 a stepping stone, as it were, to there. So with a brief glimpse of Parnassus itself there, um, we'll go on to the, the first of our pieces, um, which is from the initial grade. Um, I saw uh, a review of the Avery Arsene Piano syllabus a, a very short while ago, and it said, um, talked about the lovely pieces that were in, in the initial grade, which of course replaces um, the prep test. Well, you'll be pleased to know the initial grade does not replace the prep test. So uh, if you've seen that particular review or seen anything similar, that's not true. Both of them are still there. Um, uh, of course, the prep test is not assessed. It's, it's a, a, a wonderful, as an examiner, I can say it's, it's one of the most wonderful moments when a young pupil comes in to do their prep test and they play their pieces through and they play their tunes um, and you're able to write them a, the really nice um, comment handwritten on a, on a certificate um, and explain you know, what, what you thought was really good about their performances and maybe some things that they, they might improve. Um, and uh, you know, everybody wins in a prep test, which is lovely. Of course, an initial grade is a, a proper a, a assessment where you get a pass and fail and those sorts of things. Um, and there are some lovely little pieces that have been chosen for the initial grade, which is still, and I'm talking, I'm taking off my ABRSM hat here, and I'm talking as a teacher, I would say all the pieces in the initial grade are still many, many months into, uh, if not a year into, learning to play the piano. It depends on the age of your pupil and uh, whether they've had experience of other music and instruments and things. But actually, from a pianist's point of view, these pieces are still quite, quite sophisticated. Um, I'm going to start, though, uh, with a piece called Secret Footpath here from the initial grade. It's very beautiful, um, and it's, it's one of those pieces that you can, you can immediately draw your pupil into with a, with a sort of a story. You, you know, wh what's going on, for instance, in these lovely little right-hand phrases? <laughs> sort of uh, almost, um, it's not modal, but it, it sounds modal because we don't get the B flat there at all. Uh, the, sort of slight s um, suspicious nature of it, the sort of uncertainty, there's I've never been down this footpath before, I'm not sure where I'm going. And so you get that, those sort of lovely, ta -da, 
teeny tiny as you explore every little corner. Um, and it needs some lovely musical shape. It's Mark Metz piano at the beginning. But we were talking about grade eight and about having, creating this lovely sense of melodic line and shape above all those accompaniment figures in one hand and the, and the left hand and all the rest of it. Well, here it's much simpler. But this is where this level of challenge idea comes in. It's the, the notes are simpler here. So, so it's not going to take a pupil as long to learn, one would hope. They're at a certain stage where the notes are relatively easy for them to get, get the hang of. But in terms of interpretation, we can challenge them to the utmost. So in other words, um, these little phrases, having just a, that little decrescendo through the first one, like a, what, what is that? You just think, I don't know, you know. Ooh, you know, just what is that one? And going around the corner and, oh, I can see what's there now. And so we have those little, little shapes within the phrases. And of course, encouraging a, a, a bolder phrase as well. So a phrase that goes, and then a little bit louder. And then even louder towards the E, and then we can come down again. So there's lots we can explore using our imagination to, to decide how we're going to shape that phrase. And underneath it all is this sort of calm suspicion that goes on in the left hand. And it's so important that these notes are all held down to provide that lovely bed, that, that bed of harmony that's there. This happens a lot uh, when you get to grade eight pieces and beyond. There are loads of instances where you actually need to be able to hold down harmonies with your fingers because you can't use your pedal at those moments in time because there's too much going on. And the harmony changes perhaps a little bit in the right hand or the scale changes and you have to change pedal, but you can't change the harmony underneath. So holding down those notes is important. More important, I would say here, uh, is listening to the second note of the accompaniment. Because what we want at the end of this bar is for those notes to be equal in sound. Not this, where the second note is louder, because that's also going to interfere with a little bit of our tune. But when we get to the end, so the notes are about the same. So in other words, the second note needs to be a little bit quieter than the bottom note, because the bottom note's already died down a little bit. And that listening to a gentler second note or a gentler third beat of the bar or a gentler third, fourth beat of the bar to get a, 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 a lovely sort of homogenous harmony at the end is an important skill. It comes back later and later, time after time. Chopin nocturnes, you know, if you've got... They have to decrescendo as they go through. Otherwise, these all these middle notes here, but they, they start to they, they start to interfere with the melody. And so here it starts with the initial grade in terms of the listening skills that are that are needed. And taking the performance beyond those dynamics that are marked on that page. Uh, so mezzo piano is not just mezzo piano. It's not a thin line. It's a range of dynamic. And um, through that range of dynamic, we can shape a phrase. Uh, and making sure that our right hand is louder than our left. That's not easy to do when you're at this sort of level, but it's really important that it's done now when the notes are simple uh, and when the challenge isn't so much a, a textural. And also, of course, with all these early grade pieces, we're dealing with one mood, we're dealing with one character on the whole, which doesn't change halfway through, which it starts to do when we get into some of the later grades. Uh, and so building up from initial grades and through other pieces, making the musical challenge just as intense as it would be at a, at a grade eight, for instance, but within a simpler piece, within a piece that's not so sophisticated, within a piece where the notes are not so hard. So let's have a look at grade one. Um, and I've got um, a, a lovely piece here in grade one, which I've, I've chosen partly uh, because it involves some of the articulation that we talked about uh, in the Bach, in the Albanith, um, and in the, uh, in the Debussy. Um, and we can see here how um, shades of articulation, shades of staccato are really important. Uh, and if you listen to the pupil's performance when we get there in a minute, uh, you will hear that being shown. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. But meanwhile, and more importantly, probably we have the composer themselves giving a little introduction to their piece. Hello, I'm Shruti Rajasekhar and my piece, Virginia Hall, is part of the new piano syllabus, grade one. The piece is based on the real life woman, Virginia Hall, who worked in espionage 
spying for the Allied forces during World War II. I was fascinated by her life story, so I imagined what it might have been like to be in her position and wrote this piece. Another cool connection to me is that she was a US American who moved to Britain for a few years. And I did the same for a couple years before moving back. A little bit about me. I am a composer and a vocalist. In addition to Western classical music, I'm a practitioner of Carnatic music, South Indian classical music. And a fun fact about me is that I just donated my hair for the eighth time. Something I'm very passionate about is the idea that all of us have creativity in us. Whether that means that we compose full melodies or we like to hum along to the sound of the refrigerator drone. All of that is creativity. And I think as performers, we need to give air to that creativity. We need to exercise it just like we practice. We should take the time to play around, to discover new things, to imagine. So finally, I'd like to invite all of you as you're working on Virginia Hall to think about how you might have written this piece. If you were encountering her life story and you wanted to honor it in some way, what are the creative decisions you might have made if it were your piece? That's what I used to do as a beginner piano student. And here we are now. I hope you enjoy Virginia Hall. And now we're gonna hear the performance by a pupil. I love the way he ends that. It's wonderful, wonderfully cheeky. Um, uh, one of the things that the composer didn't say, of course, was that Virginia Hall um, was um, one of the things that she'd have been very used to. One of the things that that sort of revolves around her is, is Morse code, and and there is no question, I think, that the composer in her mind had a little bit of Morse code in the background, sort of dot 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 dash dash dash, and all the rest of it. And that gives us a little bit of a um, an inroad into what we do with the staccato here. And and the reason I'm mentioning this is because. Um, with the Albanus later on and with the Debussy, a staccato dot, as I mentioned, is never just a staccato dot. And you might think, well, it's too complicated to deal with a variety of different lengths of notes, a different staccato um, at, at, at grade one. It really isn't. Um, you know, there, is no, there, is a, there was a little phrase that tended to sort of come from teachers quite a lot, particularly a few years ago, which was, well, do you really expect that it's only grade one? And I think the most important thing is to, bear, to bear in mind is, is that the fact that a piece is set for grade one is not because uh, the examiner and all the teachers uh, uh, is expecting anything less than a really musical performance of it. You know, a musical performance is exactly what we want, right to the very highest level. It's just that the notes are not so difficult, so therefore it's possible for somebody who's on the early rungs of the learning ladder to be able to do it. That's the important thing. So yes, uh, you know, the idea of being able to play this phrase with a, with a slightly different articulation. Slight, I'm doing it slightly longer here. I'm doing it in slow motion. Also, so, and a slightly longer staccato on the second one as well. So you can hear slightly longer staccato, shorter, and then uh, and then two slightly different staccato notes to end the bar. And it gives you that phrase, that phrasing and that shape. You can actually phrase and shape a, um, a whole C major scale using this. Have a listen to this. So essentially at the beginning, I'm really doing a super legato, almost three notes down at the same time, then two notes overlapping, then no notes overlapping, and then more shorter as I go up. And that's the way harpsichordists, for instance, will shape a phrase using a really fine variety of articulation. 
Um, and we need to be encouraging that straight away here with, with, with this particular piece. It gives a wonderful inroad for that um, and takes us on that journey, as I say, that path to, towards the Albano. Um, so let's go on to a grade two piece. And uh, this is the uh, Candy Love Song. Um, and we, if you, uh, again, if you remember the, uh, see if I can just find it again. Um, so that is, I'll be with you in two seconds. So remember with the, with the fact where we've got this sort of, um, and we've got an accompaniment in the right hand, and we've got a tune in the right hand there. Well here, of course, the accompaniment is in the left hand and the tune is in the right. And you may think, well, that doesn't relate to this, but it relates hugely to it because a lot of balance is about listening. It's about listening and adjusting. And, and um, when we're working at balance between the hands here, we want to have a beautifully quiet left hand here to allow the right hand to sing through. So anything that sounds a bit noty or a little bit intrusive like this, sound very musical it's certainly not going to be very persuasive um, we need to actually make sure that this accompaniment here is beautifully soft so the listening skills the judgment that the performer makes about how soft they need to play this on this piano on any other piano in a different concert hall they have to use their ears to tell them and they have to have the ability to be able to adjust that's really important because those listening skills are transferable to this so I'm listening to my accompaniment there in the same way I'm listening to my accompaniment here. Uh, but a little secret here, I, I'm, I'm hoping that some of you can actually still see my, my hand here on, on the other um, device. But the secret here is to actually hold down the triad, so I'm actually holding it down here, um, and then just lift the notes enough to play them again. So all I'm literally doing is holding the notes down, lifting each note just enough to make sure that the next note sounds. And so effectively they're held down all the time but lifted to play again. And you get that lovely sound. Now that's not marked on here. That's not the sort of thing that a composer marks. That's the sort of thing that an interpreter needs. They say, I need this sort of sound. This is how I do it. Um, and that's a, a, a wonderful thing to be getting used to now because... Because I'm actually almost doing the same thing here. Even though it's marked like this in the Mozart, I'm holding all these notes down to give me harmonies there and give this lovely warmth of harmony underneath. And it starts here in this, in this Canding Love Song. And what about the musical shape and the articulation? It's got to sound song-like. We have this lovely little crescendo and decrescendo, which is actually marked in here, which is nice. Um, and how short are these notes? Well, perhaps not as short as they look, actually. Um, and uh, here, here is a, um, a, a pupil, actually, from the school in which I teach at. Uh, it was a little bit of a surprise. He's been here three years. Nobody really knew anything about him. He doesn't learn a musical instrument, or he, we didn't know he learned a musical instrument, until um, we had uh, a concert. And he said, oh, I'll play in the concert. And we said, oh, what are you going to play? He said, I'm going to play a piece on the halusi. Well, um, I was only vaguely familiar with even what a halusi was. And so he turned up dressed in traditional costume um, and played this. I'm going to give you a little sample of it because it gives you a really clear idea of how you might shape and articulate this, this melody. hauntingly beautiful but you could the, the, the articulation and the shape of the two things I really wanted you to listen to there and of course um, even if we're talking about pieces like the Albanus at grade 8 which is very articulated um, or, or the Debussy um, just understanding that variety of articulation how articulation can color 
a piece is important at this stage of grade two so that those, that musical experience and understanding is brought through the grades. Um, so moving on to grade three, oh, sorry, in fact grade four, we're going to just skip a grade here. We're going on to a, a little piece called Daydream. Am I, no, am I right here? Sorry, I seem, seem to have missed a piece. Um, no, sorry, we're going to stay at grade two. I'm going to stay at grade two just for a little piece called Daydream. Day I'm just going to mention a little bit about this uh, because, um, uh, because if you have a look here, the right hand has sort of accompaniment figures. Um, and I just wanted to mention that in pieces like this, where you've got this lovely sort of atmosphere, that holding down idea of actually holding down a chord, holding down a chord and just lifting to play, gives you what we call a pedaled legato. So in other words, we're not going to use pedal, but we are giving it that sound as if we use some pedal. And there's also the option here of including a little bit of rubato too. So, you know, when does rubato sound out of time? You know, when it, it's really when it doesn't have a relationship to a pulse. So the, uh, um, the pianist needs to know about what in time is, but at the same time they need to be pulling against it or pushing against it to give, give this idea of this daydream. Uh, but in bar nine, um, one of the things that I haven't talked about and I haven't got time to talk about really is, is this journey towards um, uh, different sort of voices in, t in terms of contrapuntal playing. Um, but have a look in bar nine and you'll notice that we've got some imitative playing here. Almost a canon to start with. Um, and the idea of having these two voices, independent right hand and independent left hand, uh, that's of course really important for Bach later on, uh, Bach, Handel, doesn't matter, um, uh, even, even Scarlatti at times. Um, so there are always these little moments which we can say, oh, that's interesting, that's important for me to focus on in terms of interpretation, in terms of control, because they're going to encounter this later on when the going gets much more difficult. And so now we will move on to, to grade four. Um, and uh, this is a, a little piece called Ideal, which is a lovely, naive, happy-go-lucky, really beautiful, pretty piece. Uh, it sounds a bit like this. Absolutely lovely. And of course we want this wonderful enchanting shape in the right hand, we've sort of talked a little bit about that before. Um, and also we want this, these sort of harmonies in the left hand, which are here introduced uh, um, with the pedal. Now we've not talked a lot about pedal, but I did talk to you a little bit about pedaled legato, holding down the notes. Um, pedaling is one of the best colourful and most colourful tools we can actually use in playing. And I thought it might be worth just spending a, a minute or two talking about pedaling. Um, because it's actually, in some ways it's much simpler and in some ways it's much more complicated than I think people realise. Uh, the pedal um, is, f is first of all more of a switch than the, than the una corda. The una corda pedal, the left hand uh, pedal on a, on a decent piano will change every bit of the way that you push it down. It will change the quality of the sound. From the moment that the keyboard on a grand piano starts to move to one side, um, particularly on the grand piano, uh, you will hear a difference in the sound. So as that, soft, that una corda goes down, the sound will change. Um, with the um, damper pedal, with the right hand pedal, the sound only really starts to change once those dampers lift off that, that, the string. And for the first millimetre of the lift of that damper off the string, uh, it, you can have a sort of slightly fuzzy sound. After that, once the damper is off the string, it doesn't change at all. The only time that this pedal works is at the point at which the damper comes up off the string and then it does nothing. After that, it doesn't matter. And you'll find that with the damper pedal, you will get a little bit of movement where nothing will happen on the pedal and then suddenly it will come off the string and then after that, there's nothing. So all the only bit of the pedal movement we need is that tiny, tiny bit where the damper lifts off the string. And the reason that we've got a bigger throw is because the bass strings down here have a much bigger amplitude, so they need a bit more space. So when we're dealing with really big chords and things, we want the pedal right down so that the bass strings have more space before the damper to, to, uh, to move. Other than that, the only bit we need is this tiny bit here. Um, and that's something that, with, certainly with my pupils, I encourage right from the word go, is this point of contact 
the point of contact where the dampers meet the string and where the dampers lift off the string. So uh, you probably can't see my foot here, I, I don't know, but uh, it's literally, the pedal goes down a bit until the dampers start to lift. You feel that moment of resistance and then it's just the next little bit. And that's all you need in terms of the damper pedal. And it's a little bit the same on upright. right? You won't feel the resistance in the same way, but you need to find that point of contact. So the, so the actual pedal movement is very small. Even in these little phrases, my foot is not right the way down to the floor at all. It's just enough to allow those strings to vibrate freely. And that means that I can do a quick change because I only have to go up a little bit to change the harmonies. Um, and so in terms of control of the pedal, that's the one big tip I would give is, is that in the very earliest stages, encourage your students not to think about the pedals being up right at the top and down right at the bottom, but just to be controlling it on that middle bit like the clutch on the car. Um, and in terms of pedal, it's a wonderful tool for judging balance because this chord here, ideally you want a nice balanced chord at the end of it all. So we do a decrescendo because that D's going to last longer than that G has and then that B has. So we do a decrescendo to it. And now we can hear here that the E is the loudest note because I've got my pedal held down still. So the pedal can be a really good tool for discovering the balance. There, my D is still the loudest note. My chord is still just beautifully resonating underneath. It's still there. If I did this, now you can hear that my C is the loudest note. So it's, it's, it's a, a lovely tool, as I say, for, for practicing with. If you can encourage your pupils to listen to every note and say, which is the loudest note? Is that the note, note that you want to be the loudest? <clears throat> and the other thing I want to say about melodies here is it's very easy to start melodies with a bump. Uh, so we go... Um, and uh, you'll often hear... Uh, see on an exam script that the melodies were a little bit disjointed or, or over accented or these sorts of things um, because melodies don't often have an accented start to the note. Uh, so here where we start with an anacrusis we want to make sure the right hand is prepared in advance and softly on the top of the E and crochet those to the main note and then And, uh, and that gives us a, a much more sense of, of a journey. We don't stop the journey the moment we go out of the door. We actually head out and we carry on walking. Um, and I'm muting myself, did you know? Um, so uh, think about the melody, think about the accompaniment, think about how the pedal works there, um, and about the overall shape of the melody, even at grade four. And, we, uh, and then that will give this piece the, ch the charm that it really needs. And then moving on to a grade five piece, one of my favourites here. Uh, this is a, a lovely piece by Dorothy Pinning. So again, we're focusing in on, on, on a, a diverse range of composers and also the majority of the, uh, of the compositions I'm talking about here are by female composers. Um, this is... Um, Again, really quite beautiful, as I say. Um, this is Philomena, who changed into a nightingale. And the one thing I love about this, which I sort of discovered when I was playing it through this morning, because um, as some of you probably know, I wasn't expecting to do this. And, uh, and I thought, I'll just play some of these pieces through, just, check, just to remind myself. And I just played through the Albanian, and I arrived at this moment. <laughs> remarkably Spanish, really Spanish, um, just in the rhythms and the shapes of it. And, and of course it reminded me of something, I thought, what does it remind me of? And I suddenly re realised it reminds me of, the, of, of some Granados, which is called, called The Maiden and the Nightingale, which is another piece you might know, a piano piece. Uh, so there is a little bit of the sort of, Spani of Spanishness in here, uh, mainly actually I think linked by the idea of this nightingale. I think that's what Dorothy Pinning has tried to do there, is, and, and she's perhaps subconsciously linked it into Granados, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, this is the piece, it's very beautiful. I want to talk particularly about the pedalling and balance in this.
enchanting music, isn't it? Very beautiful. Um, pedaling. Uh, the thing about pedalling is that it's very hard to notate pedal, um, and you'll find that this with Chopin, with, 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 with Brahms, with lots of different composers, Beethoven. Um, the pedalling doesn't always work necessarily. It's sort of a bit vague, and uh, I think there are some composers who are much more particular than others. Um, Dorothy Pinning here is quite particular about the pedalling, but we have this strange um, juxtaposition of a staccato note not in the right. Now, bear in mind we're repeating the A, it's going to be staccato anyway, so why has Dorothy written a staccato dot on it? Because it's going to have to be separated from the next one. Uh, my feeling is that it's staccato because it needs to be staccato. But if you do that and you put your pedal down where marked, you can sort of give the impression of a staccato there, but you can't really make it detached. Um, so in fact the pedal marking I think here uh, is better would be better actually put on the second beat of the bar. But if you put it on the second beat of the bar, what's going to happen? I suspect that you'll get a lot of uh, young pins just simply now go this chord. Um, and this is where some of the more sophisticated pedaling that we use later on, particularly the mazurka pedaling, uh, is, is, is almost developed. It's a wonderful chance to, sh to show people how to use the pedal properly. So we don't use the pedal here. We use the pedal there on this A, on this top second A, but notice that that left hand is still held down. Because I haven't used pedal, I need to hold it down until the pedal holds it itself. Then it's the same thing there. So the pedal's up, it goes down with that note, whilst that left hand fifth is held down. Um, otherwise you get this, here are the two choices there. Are there as a guide, but they don't work, if you see what I mean. And this is all about interpretation, frustrating as it may seem. Very little that we see on the score uh, is literal. Most of it is the composer's best possible way of explaining something, and they, and they often think, if I explained it a different way and made it more literal, in fact, it would make it worse. Uh, there would be other interpretations that, that actually would be far removed from what I wanted. So, so this is what they put. Um, so that's the first thing, thinking about the pedal and making sure the pedal changes are after the harmony, as it were, as well. So when we get to bar two, making sure the pedal changes after you can actually hear that. And we encourage pupils to hear, to hear the, the conflict of the two harmonies so that when you lift the pedal, you get a clarity. So you're listening not to that chord, but the previous chord how it disappears when you lift the pedal and then put it down again. And that can really nurture some amazing quality pedaling from, from students. In terms of balance, of course, we're getting into territory here where we've got three left hand notes for every one right hand note. So balance is even more important. Control of balance by this stage, because we've done it in the initial grade, we've done it in grade one, grade two, we know they can do good balance between the hands, or we hope that they can. Uh, but here, it's about listening and exploring it further, saying, saying well, if, because you've got a chord, it has to be even softer than it would be if it were single chords. And the other thing that I would really hope to be able to discuss and, uh, and maybe encourage in my pupils is a different quality of tone to the opening, which is more of a cantabile sort of sound, where you've got weight behind your fingers, walking my weight from one finger to the next to give that really nice projected cantabile sound. And later on where I want a more sort of filigree, decorative, um, uh, light sort of sound, where we get this. So. That sort of, rather, rather than that sound, sound, that sort of sound. Um, and of course, one of the things that that brings into focus as well is, of course, we've got a change of mood in the middle here. We've got the nightingale singing in the middle of this piece, and in the opening we've got a Pas um, uh, 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 sort of and sunshine and things, and then the nightingale calling in the middle, or, or her changing to the nightingale, or however it goes. Um, and so I want, we've got a different sort of, uh, of 
uh, mood altogether. And this is what happens as we go through the grades. We get those pieces in, in the early grades where it's all one mood, it's all one character. And then as we go through some of the later grades, we start to build in changes of mood. And those changes of mood need to be there in the sound and colour um, as, as well as in the mind and in the emotion that you're trying to convey. Um, moving on to grade six, uh, we've got an, another wonderful piece called Honey. Um, and uh, I hold up my hands and admit that I have actually chosen a piece here which it has been in uh, the uh, uh, grade exams before. Um, I'll let you into a little secret that for 20 years, up until um, 2019, so 20 years, um, I was responsible with a colleague for choosing all of the pieces that go into the graded exams. So um, uh, any of you who took grade exams over the last 20 years, piano exams, uh, will have played pieces that started off probably um, in big piles on the, on, my, um, on the floor of this very room that I'm teaching in now. And the reason I'm telling you that is because every time I see this piece, I can still remember the front cover of the piece that this came from because it's one of those things you can play through reams and reams and reams of music and think oh that's quite good but the ending's too hard and that's quite good that the beginnings the middle bit's too difficult um, and then you come across a piece and you just get that is charming and i remember sitting at the piano playing it time after time thinking i love this piece i love this and i know some of my pupils are going to love it too um so so it's i've got quite a fondness for this about this piece is this middle section um, because one of the things that we don't really encounter up until this point are big dramatic chords a little bit we have done in some of the Walter Carroll um, uh, pieces uh, where we've got sort of um, those sorts of chords and things like the Tchaikovsky piano concerto but they're very few and far between those sorts of pieces this is lovely because we've got Not only loud chords, but loud chords where we need to balance them to the top. Um, and we've got a playfulness, in, a rhythmic playfulness in the opening. So even though we've got this quite, quite tricky jumping left hand, we have to be able to play with the pulse. And decide just how long this pause is going to be. And that's a matter of interpretation. You know, it could be that long, if you like. And things that um, I, um, I tend not to miss, and, uh, and I would encourage you to think about as well, um, are when we have little moments which are very big learning uh, steps, as it were. And one of those is here, where that is the melody, and we get shifting inner harmonies. There. Those are only relevant in the sense they change the harmony. They're not melodies. And it's very easy to go. So our tune becomes... Which of course it isn't. And when we get onto more uh, 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 conventional, sophisticated repertoire, uh, when you're onto Beethoven and Mozart um, uh, uh, or Clementi or whatever it might be, those things happen all the time with these lovely shifts of harmony within the middle textures where the melody has to continue. The melody still needs to be a, a calling on the audience's uh, attention. So the D is still there as the primary note. And it's only a little moment. And if it doesn't happen well, it doesn't happen. But actually being aware of it and trying to control that is such a serious step forward towards the later grade repertoire. So don't miss out on little things like that within a piece um, that are so musically significant, and it is musically significant here, it makes a big difference. Uh, you know, small things often do make big differences. Um, and focus in on those. Uh, and that's, again, why we need to make sure that it, this isn't a, a grade five pianist struggling to do grade six. This is a grade seven pianist who can, you know, somebody who can play grade, the notes of grade seven doing grade six because you can focus much more on the on the musical outcome, which is so important 
uh, in the way that we actually use assessments and, and we use ABRSM exams, for instance. Um, so uh, balance as well, of course, there are issues even harder with this sort of leaping left hand too. Uh, so think about that. Uh, and then just finally, I've got a little piece by uh, Martinet here, and I've uh, rather wickedly included this because it doesn't, it relates a little bit to the Albanith um, and it relates to, um, let's just find it here. Excuse me one second. Yeah, so, um, and, and it relates a little bit to the, the Martin, to the Albanith and, uh, and things because of its articulation um, and also because of the control. If you remember those, <laughs> those triplet figures that were in the semicolonage tailor as well. Um, but I haven't talked much about control of semiquavers, not enough time to talk about everything. Uh, but in this particular piece, it just allows me just to touch on a few of those things. Um, and also one of the things that tends to distort and affect quite a lot of performances, which is this ability to be able to go from duplets into triplets. Um, but this Marion de Vermontanus is a piece really worth highlighting. So it's a minuet tempo, so we think of dance, we go one, two, three, one, two, one, two. into triplets and things, this is actually quite an easy piece. Um, and in many ways you could say, yes, it is, it's very easy. Note-wise, but actually in terms of conveying what you need to convey, the musical outcome is really hard won. Um, what sort of things make this come to life? Well, not this. If I played the triplets in bar two, for instance. <laughs> Dishwater. They don't dance at all, they've got nothing about them. Um, in order to really make those triplets sound beautiful, I'm going to do this in slow motion. I'll do it fast first of all. And now slow motion. You can hear how the articulation, the, the, the variety of detachedness, as it were, um, through those changes quite considerably. And of course, we've got a little bit of a, an echo effect here. So we, can, we need to be able to do the same thing within a sort of mezzo forte dynamic and a mezzo piano dynamic. So. Um, those of you who worry about trills and ornaments, this could be anything. It could be what's written on the page. I just, just do a natural trill there with 3-1, but um, you could you can't play what's actually written there, just a simple turn. Um, don't get too worried about ornamentation. Um, it, it, the one key thing about ornamentation is it mustn't interfere with the flow um, at this stage, and, um, and you can encourage your, your, your people to experiment with it later on when they feel a bit more comfortable. Um, uh, and just one final point about this, really, which is a little bit later on, we've got some phrases. This is in bar 28. Uh, we've got... We've got some little phrases like that where we've got um, what I call some hidden melodies and they occur in, in, in lots of Bach and in lots of Baroque music where we have um, phrases that those sorts of, those sorts of phrases where we have, actually have the, the sort of what I call the hidden melody underneath uh, which also needs shape and, and there's little things like that so, that we can sort of point out as we go. Um, so it's a very beautiful grade seven piece, um, uh, very sophisticated, actually easy in terms of the notes, but, but much more demanding and challenging in terms of how you're going to convey the points in the elegance of the dance. Uh, but a lot of what we've got on here, the articulation, the shaping, um, and uh, particularly uh, lots of the things that we were talking about in some of the earlier grade pieces, you can see how they all lead into this fabulous grade eight re repertoire, which I know that Lots of our pupils are aspiring to, and, and we as teachers really enjoy teaching. But you will enjoy teaching it much more if so many of those foundation skills, the, 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 the control, um, particularly of balance and articulation and pedal, and the, uh, and the listening skills, to be able to, the ability for our pupils to be able to teach themselves, um, if they are all there when they actually start approaching those, that grade eight repertoire, then it, uh, it can be a really rewarding musical experience. Uh, so that's the sort of, last piece that I've got to demonstrate. Um, I don't know whether there are any questions. I've got some more I could talk about if you, if you wish to in terms of 
uh, sort of journeying through repertoire, or um, I can just um, make a fool of myself and answer some questions. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just. I don't know why the recording stopped. That's fair. We've had an issue with the live stream, so anybody who had to join oh, us. No. Um, so the, apparently, um, the Mozart piece was copyrighted by Sony. So it, it blocked it for 249 countries. Anyway, this is beside the point. Uh, if you would like to, there are no questions so far and nobody's asked any questions about your cup of tea. You are welcome to have maybe 10 more minutes if you wish to keep Yeah, of course. Going. Well, I tell you what, I've got, I've got a little sort of, um, it's a sort of a musical journey quiz because I talked about pieces where we've got these musical journeys up, up to grade eight. So um, here are a couple of other pieces uh, which I think are on the PowerPoint, Rachel. So I think we've got um, a grade one-ish piece. Um, there we go. Little Whale Explores the Calm Sea. Uh, grade one. So I'm just looking for my own grade one book, which seems to have disappeared here. There we go. Hidden, hidden underneath the wealth of stuff here. Um, so this is a, a, a wonderful, really lovely piece. Uh, it involves pedal for the first time, which uh, you know, in an early grade, which is great. If, so if your pupil can actually reach the pedal, and and from a teacher's perspective, I'm, I, I try and encourage my pupils to reach for the pedal, as it were, reach for the stars, reach for the pedal as soon as they possibly can um, by sitting on the sort of edge of their seat, if necessary. If they're too small, so be it. But if they've got one of these sort of allegro things that they can put over the pedals, or if they can reach the pedal, that's great. This is wonderful because it just gives them an idea of simply getting having their foot on the pedal and holding it down um, uh, and you get this wonderful atmospheric sort of deep sea sound with this um, little whale um, which is I assume the sort of right hand tune <laughs> Sort of dramatic forte that you get later on with the with the with the deep C down here. Now playing with the pedal held down uh, um, is is quite an art. It's quite a listening skill again because if you play things like this and you make too much of those quavers, it sounds very muddy and uh, and and slightly confused. So actually, what we need we actually need to think about what sound we make through that. Whether we do a little decrescendo, we just lighten the quavers. Um, how much we come down in a, in a decrescendo if we're using the pedal, how much we come up. So for instance here, how, how loud do we want this to be? And how loud do we want these chords in particular to be with when, we've got the chord, when we've got the pedal held down? Because those notes will interfere much more with that melody than this will. So we can listen a little bit to that. Get a little bit quieter at the end of that phrase because all of that those harmonies have sort of um, uh, descended into the murkiness as it were so this listening to atmospheric sound and color is really important and, and, and listening to the brightness of, of the right hand melody here um, as this little word explores the sea um, pedaled colored sounds that's what this piece is all about and the more we can spend exploring and being creative and imaginative with our pupils about what the story is, what the whale is doing, how deep is the sea, how much is the sea moving, all these sorts of things. And what does that sound like in music? It's one of my favourite things. Um, you, want, you want to sound like, you want it to, this emotion expressed, that colour expressed, this picture expressed, whatever it might be. Um, if you want that, what does that actually sound like in music? What does it sound like in this piece? So we can have a little think about that with that, with, with that beautiful whale piece. And then if we move onwards to um, a grade five piece here, um, and we've, we've got the idea of being able to use our pedal now uh, about tonal texture and color and atmosphere. And we've got something that's much more sophisticated here uh, in terms of that, uh, just find the page.
some of these lovely warm harmonies um, and, and this sort of this star like upper part. So again we're listening very much here to the pedal, control the pedal, making sure that we blend pedals. So here the idea of blending pedaling, playing the chord, listening to that dissonance, which is you know the, the clash of the harmonies, gently lifting the chord, the pedal and then putting it down again so that we actually overlap. The pedal pedals here but when we've got chords with pedal we have to be even more conscious of the top line if that's what we want to be, be brought out so i'm voicing the chord even more there um, uh, in order to bring out that brightness um, and then how much do we need there probably not quite so much because those harmonies have died down a little bit so we're listening to blending we're listening to balance we're listening to the voicing of chords um, and all within pedals and and how we how we match pedaling as it were throughout the whole of this and also then how loud do we get if you've got your pedal held down it's very easy to get almost too loud sometimes if you're not careful So then we've got sort of, um, as it's a deep, lovely universe type, empty universe type sounds, a um, bit of storytelling with, with the staff. Where do those sorts of pieces, if you, if you could play that piece, if your people could play that piece with the, that level of, uh, of control of balance, awareness of, of timbre, awareness of sound and balance, where is that leading? Um, some of you may, uh, may have thought, oh yeah, I think it might be leading there. What about here? I'm sure you can all hear how all those things that were, were, we were talking about in that grade one piece, in that grade five piece, lead up to uh, La Casse de Roland Bouti there with the, with the Debussy prelude. Um, there are so many journeys to be had through these pieces, and I'm not saying for one instance that, that um, we go through those journeys in order to get there. What I'm saying is that we need to be aware of where we are going, travelling to with our pupils, and look for those opportunities in those pieces and think, actually, I know we're only playing a grade one piece, but this is preparation for that piece at grade eight and beyond. And I know we're only playing a grade three piece, but we need to play this as musically convincingly as we can now uh, with the, in a piece that is, is at this level in order to transfer those skills, to have all those wonderful listening, technical control skills and interpretative skills and knowledge and understanding of those pieces to be able to play this fabulous repertoire later on. Um, and I think the more we can think of um, our repertoire, this, this amazing repertoire that we have for our graded pieces, the more we can think of them as a, as a journey, as, as somebody's done the hard work for us, in other words, in terms of giving us pieces which are at particular levels, rather than this is a stepping stone to grade two, to grade three, to grade four, because they're not really that. They're just signposts. Um, and a lot of my pupils will be taking their grade eight well, uh, well after they've been able to take their grade eight. You know, they could have taken it a year ago. But there's just no point. Wait until they can give that grade eight all of their musical attention rather than just simply struggling to get from the beginning to the end. And it's a much more rewarding experience for them um, and for the teacher. So uh, just, a, just a couple of other things then. Uh, if there are no questions, I don't know, maybe there will be very shortly, but um, there is a, lots of other ABRSM material available now. Uh, so I think there's a slide to demonstrate some of that. Um, or will be come out, Rachel, I'm not sure. Um, but don't, don't forget about um, teaching notes, I think, which is available for some of you. We've got the piano exam pieces, but uh, myself and one or two of my colleagues have written quite a few notes for teaching the pieces, just a bit of advice and, uh, and some thoughts on that. Um, 
uh, and dig some digital sheet music to explore as well. Uh, and uh, go out there and look at some of the apps as well, which I would say you know, some of the apps that, that ABS have produced are brilliant um, and really, really useful. So explore some of those, whether it's all site reading or whatever it might be. Uh, so there we go. Are there, are there any questions yet, sir, at all? I will add a spotlight one second. Add spotlight. I just saw one popped in. Um, what is the okay. intended age range for initial grade? Oh, that's okay. So it's not done by age whatsoever. No. So anything from uh, a very talented three year old, I would say, right up to uh, a very ambitious 96 year old. I know I can't exclude 110 year olds. So that, uh, yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, it's not about age. It's all about ambition and, uh, and all about wanting to play the piano. And if you want to start learning to play the piano at the age of 96, then you can. And the initial grade might be a really nice way of summing up a year's hard work uh, learning, learning to play the piano and having some recognition of where you've got to. Mm. I want to reinforce something you said, because I think you, you said so many brilliant things, but the thing that really struck out to me, and I think it's something that particularly new teachers don't always understand, that we, when we are teaching, we are using pieces to prepare for future pieces. Sometimes we may, we may need to add to the exam. If, if, we, if we're just learning to do three pieces and then three pieces and then three pieces from one year to the next, we're not necessarily building skills. And I liken it to a period and I a pyramid and I apologize to anybody who's heard my image before, but the, the beginning is the most important part of the pyramid and it's the bottom layer and it's the biggest part. And so if we're getting to grade eight, if we have a really good foundation, then the grades get easier because we're building on a solid foundation. It's a bit hard to get my fingers to meet on the screen. But um, <laughs> this solid foundation is a, an appearance like this. But I find sometimes teachers go, oh, initial's easy. And they do it the other way around. And oh, yeah, quickly learn to read notes, quickly learn. And here we go, we've done initial. And then we get to grade eight and we topple over. Sometimes we don't make it to grade eight because we've already toppled. It can be hard when the syllabus changes every couple of years to think, oh, how am I going to program things? And for me personally, I have the program and then the, the exam pieces add on top of that. So, but you, you can do it either way, obviously, but this, this is concept that how are we gonna build from one to another? Because it's not just about learning three pieces. It's not even just about learning three pieces they like, even though that's great if they like them, but just well, focusing. Let me let everyone into a, a secret, uh, which is that Mozart and Beethoven and Brahms and Chopin never took an ABRSM exam in their life. <laughs> it didn't even exist. Oh, astonishing. How on earth could they ever be great pianists and musicians if they didn't take an ABRSM exam? The honest truth is, ABRSM exams are there as a lovely signpost, as recognition of a level of achievement, but that what they are absolutely not is a structure for a curriculum. That is not what they are, uh, not in any way. And so um, there will be some pupils who will uh, take two, three years maybe to get to initial grade, uh, but you've got lots of fabulous resources out there mm -hmm. um, for, uh, for them to use and, and, and to keep music creative and exciting and interesting for them. And there are some pupils who will, who will go through the grades, for, perhaps the first two or three grades, quite happily playing very musically, re really happily getting fantastic marks, and then may just need a little bit of stability for a while because there are certain listening skills, technical skills, uh, experienced understanding skills they may you know may not, not be able to relate to some of the pieces well enough and that's the point at which the teacher builds in all this other repertoire there are so many volumes of amazing music rediscovered music new music that are being published by publishers every single day um, uh, it, you could fill the whole of my music school probably with the amount of music that you have available to you from grade zero to grade eight um, if you just focus in on the music that's in those grade, uh, graded assessments, you are really depriving your pupils of so much uh, imaginative and creative material. And, uh, and um, it, it's the wrong way around, really. I mean, we try and make the assessment material, the assessment pieces really interesting and engaging for pupils because that would be wrong to do anything else. But it is not the bill and end all. And I have a, I don't use a pyramid, I use a graph. So I have a graph that I present to teachers where I say, you know, the, the, if you are, the, the journey towards being a really good pianist is one where the graph starts off here and stays level and stays level and stays level and goes up a tiny bit, tiny bit, tiny bit. And then just towards the end, it does this. That's the correct graph. The correct graph is not one where it goes like this and then mm. uh, levels out about halfway. And 
nobody ever gets there because it's like building a house, the foundation skills, the, the listening skills that I talk so much about, the awareness of what color and shape you can produce. Now, I guarantee that I could get any five-year-old in here being creative at the piano and creating beautiful shapes and even balancing their hands out within the space of about 20 minutes uh, at the piano and yet put a piece of music in front of them and it all stops. It's far better to develop those skills and, uh, and uh, to begin with and the, the understanding of what's possible before you start putting notes in front of them and, for, and saying, well, actually, it's all about you playing an E there. Uh, it's not, actually. It's all about creating music mm. and having a, a, an emotional connection, that, um, that emotional and personal umbilical cord to the music you're playing. And we've got to give the students time to absorb what they're learning. When we, we've got a baby and they say mama and then we don't go, OK, next word now. You know, they, they yeah. take time, they take a while before the next word's added. So I think it's the same with our students. Sometimes we've got, we're, we're goal oriented and goal oriented is great. I'm the queen of loving exams. Um, if anyone ever wants to see my certificate pile because I'm crazy, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, that's not, <laughs> you know, the, 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 that is just, you know, like I think I used a different word. I can't even remember, but it's like the cream on top or something that it, it just shows what have we covered in our curriculum? What skills have we developed? And, and it's great. I love exams. They're such a great motivator for students, but they're not the be all and end all. It's the, the journey to get there where we can go this way and wait, wait for the child or the student to develop the required skills. Now you have an editorial question, so I hope you've got your manuscripts ready. The, oh, right. oh, goodness. <laughs> the question is, grade 6A3, and let's, 6A3. how quickly okay. can you grab the book? Kulau Bar 19. Know. So the question is that um, in some editions, the last yep. in bar 19, it's a C, but other editions have a D and bar 68 oh. F versus G. What's your advice? All right, well, this is bar 19. In this copy, it's that. And in some editions, it's that. And now, that's really interesting. Well, it's all to do with sources, of course. It's all to do, that's not like HP and tomato sauce. That's like where you go back to and you, <laughs> and you find out um, the, the earliest possible manuscript that you can have. And sometimes, you know, it's not very clear. There is a, an amazing manuscript of the Mozart C minor concerto at the Royal College of Music uh, where um, Mozart has basically written out in, in immaculate, um, oh, sorry, no, somebody has written out all of all Mozart's orchestral parts and they're beautifully and immaculately written out. And at some point, somebody said to Mozart, well, hang on a second, you haven't written in the piano part. We don't know what you're playing. He'd already performed this concerto two or three times and his piano part was not written in the original manuscript. So, so at some point, Mozart's got his pen out and he's gone, oh, it's roughly this. And he scribbled it down. And do you know what? If you, even if you spent years and years, you couldn't decipher some of it. Because some of it is basically just a line, oh, well, you do maybe do this. And we all know, no Mozart, that he probably did something different every single time he played it anyway, not even what we've written down there. So he probably didn't want to commit himself half the time. <laughs> we have this obsession with detail. Of, is it a D or is it a C? The honest truth is it probably doesn't matter. It probably wouldn't have mattered too much to cool out. If you go back to the, obviously, the original editions, and ABRSM editions are really good. They tend to go back about as far as they can. Um, it's probably what was written. Was it what Kudau wanted? Now, that's a difference, because actually, I'm playing this, and I go... I don't think that sounds very Kudau to my ears, because I've played a lot of Kudau. I think... Sounds much more... It makes much more musical sense to me um, in terms of Kudau. That's not to say I'm right. It's just to say that that's what I think. Uh, so if you have an edition which has that D in it or at the end of that bar and you prefer it, go with it because some, some editor hopefully will have gone back to one of the particular first editions or, or, or second editions or whatever it might, might be and in that particular instance it might be a D. And Kuno himself might have well gone to the, sec to the publisher the second time it was published mm -hmm. and said, oh, hang on, that's wrong, that needs to be a D that time and we end up with two editions we don't know which one's right. Um, so in a sense, I can't answer your question. Only you can answer that. Is it important for the assessment? No, because there is not an examiner on the planet that I know who will question whether you play a C or a D there. Not in a million years, because they're not going to be looking at that score, studying every single note that you play and, that, and, uh, and say, oh, well, hang on one second, you know. Um, they'll, they'll have a pretty good idea if uh, things, you know, if you get yourself in a muddle or not, but they won't know if it's musically makes musical sense they won't know whether you've played a c or a d and they won't really care if it's musically played that's the thing 
I can now confess, and um, Mr. Williams doesn't know that I, I actually examined, but for an Australian board, and um, I w heard a piece being performed and I didn't have the score in front of me and there was this weird extra bar. What on earth? I went back to the manuscript and I actually understand why the editors, I think they misunder misunderstood the intention of the composer, but they'd put this weird extra bar in. So sometimes I think they misunderstood how the composer had used first and second time bars in his notation because it was slightly different to what we'd use now. Um, but it happens that they're looking at this manuscript and of course the notation is different. Sometimes they've got to debate what they put in. So yes. Never worry yeah. about that sort of thing. It's... No, no, play it, play it musically, play it with conviction and everyone will be convinced. And there are so many performances out there with um, where I, I, mean, I was hearing a performance of a Chopin mazurka the other day by a very famous pianist who I won't mention. And, um, uh, and right the way through the piece, he was playing a note that clearly wasn't written on the score in any of my editions. Uh, but did I, if I hadn't known the piece, would I have cared or known? No, absolutely not. It happens. <laughs> Now we have another question in, and a um, recommendation for where you can find alternate repertoires that you mentioned earlier. Oh my goodness me. Well, uh, it depends what sort of level you want, but of course, I mean, I, I have to, because I've got my AVRSM hat on, I have to plug loads of AVRSM public publications, which have got, I mean, people like myself and, and other people have spent a huge amount of time wading through lots of pieces saying, well, here are some really good pieces um, that you can use. Um, and so you've got, uh, you know, your uh, romantic pieces from uh, ABRSM classics to moderns. You've got uh, not classics to moderns. Um, uh, what's it called? Gr uh, keyboard anthologies, I think. Um, and uh, and uh, have a look at the ABRSM website. Basically, there's loads and loads of, of anthologies of pieces which you can use. Um, there's if you want pieces which are have been graded. Um, am I allowed to plug myself here? That's not ABRSM. Mm -hmm. There's a Okay, so so I've released a, a series of books called um, The Best of Grade, which is published by Faber. They go up to grade five. Um, and they are all pieces which have uh, re been represented at those particular grades from one board or another, not necessarily just ABRSM. But, uh, um, <coughs> and, uh, and of course, why not look through some of all the previous ABRSM syllabuses as well? I mean, they're all out there. Um, have a look at, the, they've been going, you know, for... I suppose if you have a look since 1999, it's probably the best time. That's when the syllabus <coughs> changed fundamentally, uh, changed, um, and you've got these this big breadth of, of repertoire. And since 1999, you've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces for each grade that you could have a look at, um, and uh, and perhaps consider using for your pupils. So that gives you a little bit of a sort of a way in. Now, um, John has asked, is there any plans to release the ABRSM music scores in Braille? Oh, that's not really my domain. I don't know whether Rachel wants to come in here. She misunderstood his question in the thing, but that's because I sent him a private message. So I know. Let me just add a ah, spotlight. Okay. I'll add a spotlight for you, Rachel. Um, so for the actual repertoire, not for the not for the syllabus list, um, we work with an organisation called Allegro Music uh, to create different um, requirements that people may have. It might be large print, things like that. And I believe we do have um, whatever the file export thing is that makes Braille um, available through them. I think they are a tiny organisation and in fact I think they're basically just one person that does that work. So if you've got any requirements like that about repertoire, please do send them in to our access coordinator um, who will be very happy to kind of give you any, any steer on, on how to get repertoire to suit your needs. Um, in terms of uh, other ways of accessing material, um, a lot of our um, online material is available or can be read by screen readers if you are using that at home. Um, so we do have some, some capacity there. But yeah, please do get in touch with ABRSM if, um, you know, if you have particular needs and we'll, we'll do our best to help you. How did, how did they get in touch with the access coordinator, Rachel? I will put the email address in the chat. So just give me a second to get it and I'll do that now. Thanks, Rachel. Well, Miss, Mr. Williams, do you have any final words? Oh, I have a final question, and that is, what is the temperature currently in the UK? Oh, okay. It's 34 at the moment and rising. Yes, oh. and we're, we're, look, we're looking, well, in Oxford, we're looking at temperatures of 37, 38, I think, but in London, it's going to be hotter than that. Well, you've gone up and we've gone down to seven degrees since we started so <laughs> moving the opposite way. Um, and so um, 
yeah for people who are watching this video later it's um the email address for those who um have um needs with regards to the score is access coordinator at abrsm.ac.uk so thank you for that rachel so mr williams do you have any final words to leave with us today well only something which is a little bit of a it's it's really the philosophy of my teaching um, and which i would encourage everybody to adopt because it makes every lesson pleasurable which is to not worry too much about progression in terms of difficulty of notes but worry about the musical outcome um, and the imagination and creativity you can bring both to your lessons and to your pupils um, so you know don't be worried uh, and don't be, don't find yourself put under pressure maybe by parents necessarily or or, or, or anybody else to to go on to ever more difficult notes within the score be very happy that you can actually um, it's better to approach something where a small amount of the challenge is learning those notes the biggest part of that challenge is getting that lovely musical shape that lovely expressive sense of line the character or the personality the humor um, those are the things that make lessons a joy uh, and a, a privilege for the teacher and for the pupil um, and it's really what music is all about it's about communication and always at the end of every lesson just think to yourself how much of my lesson was about communication how much of it was literally just going to the school how much of it was a maths lesson really um, and see if you can just tilt the balance in the right direction and uh, and uh, and it will make all music much more pleasurable and finally just remember that we are not all here to produce the next daniel trifonov or richter or whatever it is they we you may be lucky enough to get one of those through your hands in the in the whole of your lifetime uh, but we are here to in in general a love of music and a passion of music in our pupils so that they become the audience for the next daniel trifonov mm -hmm. and richter and if we've done that we've done our job well mm. well mr williams thank you so much from everyone here and everyone who will watch it later when I first sort out what the live stream issue was. Um, thanks, Sony. Um, and I couldn't I must, appeal I must, it. I must have played it exactly like some other, some Sony artist. <laughs> like, <that> good? <laughs> like, come on, Facebook, at least let me appeal and say, this is public domain, at least this one is. Um, but anyway, um, I, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for firstly filling in um, today so that we could enjoy this and be inspired, but also for really reminding us of the importance of building from one level to the next rather than just aiming for the end goal so um from the bottom of my heart thank you very much yeah, and and I, I, and I speak for everyone else here so thank you thank you very much thank you and for everyone else we'll see you next time thank you for joining us bye for now bye